My name is Michael Alea, and I will be discussing knee dislocations, the other ligaments of the knee, including the PCL, posterior lateral corner, and MCL, as well as touching briefly on sports rehabilitation, as these are often tested on the ABOS exam as well as the in-service exam. We're going to start with knee dislocations. Obviously, these injuries are very high energy injuries and potentially limb threatening. When you're in the emergency room or evaluating these patients for the first time, a key is to maintain your composure. A neurovascular exam prior to reduction followed by a prompt reduction. Getting that tibiofemoral joint aligned immediately is very critical for the vascular supply of the knee. Range of motion testing, do it very gently afterwards. You don't need to go bending the knee to 130 degrees or doing significant varus or valgus. Do it very gently. You want to test their compartments as well as ABIs. If the ABI is less than 0.9, you're going to consider a CT angiogram as well as a vascular consultation and then admit these patients for observation. Caution all the residents to be rare, beware of the rotational dislocation. These are usually posterolateral rotatory dislocations, which sometimes cause the medial femoral condyle to buttonhole through the capsule, rendering it irreducible. These need to be taken to the operating room and typically open reduced. In terms of vascular injuries, these are limb threatening injuries, which we know there's about a 32% uh, rate of vascular injury to the popliteal artery, and we know that from several studies. The key is getting to these early and repairing them because if you repair them before eight hours of ischemia time, the success rate in limb salvage is 87%. With posterior dislocations, there's a higher rate of arterial rupture. As you can see, the, the patient on the right had a complete rupture of the popliteal artery at the level of the tibiofemoral joint, which ultimately required an above the knee amputation as this patient was unable to restore blood flow to the distal aspect of the leg. In terms of early versus delayed reconstruction, while we're treating these operatively, it's mostly level four evidence. What we do know is that acute reconstructions typically lead to a higher rate of arthrofibrosis, but potentially better outcomes. Chronic reconstructions or significantly delayed reconstructions based on meta-analyses have showed increased laxity in the knee. So now we're going to get into other ligaments inside the knee and we'll start with the posterior cruciate ligament. In terms of the anatomy, this is a very broadly inserting ligament on the medial femoral condyle. It's about 18 millimeters from anterior to posterior. It has an anterior lateral bundle and a posterior medial bundle, which are relatively distinct. The anterior lateral bundle is bigger, it's thicker, and biomechanically more important, but there is some elements of synergy between the two bundles. In terms of the tibial insertion, we know that this inserts very posterior on the PCL facet, almost at the level of the capsule. We've seen, re we've seen several failures in which these tunnels have been placed too anterior and the biomechanics are not restored. The majority of the working fibers of the PCL are certainly posterior, and anatomical studies have shown that this is only about 1.7 millimeters away from the capsule, thus highlighting just how posterior that ligament is. In terms of meniscal femoral ligaments, over 90% of people have at least one. The Risberg ligament is more common and is posterior. W is after H. Humphrey is anterior to posterior. In terms of the blood supply, the middle geniculate artery is the key uh, structure that gives blood to the PCL. In terms of biomechanics, the PCL is very important for posterior tibial translation, especially at 90 degrees, and it does have a component of rotational stability as well. When you lose the PCL, we know that there are increases in posterior tibial translation, external rotation, as well as varus. And as we've talked about before, there is a relative co-dominance of the bundles, where both bundles are really working through the range of motion, but the anterior lateral bundle is larger and stronger and certainly more protective against posterior tibial translation. Hence the reason why when we're reconstructing PCLs, we typically tend to reconstruct the anterior lateral bundle. In terms of mechanism of injury for isolated PCL injuries, uh, obviously motor vehicle collisions are very significant when you have a 
posterior force right along the tibial tuberosity. And then you can have sports-related injuries as well. Uh, if a patient lands onto a flexed knee with the foot plantar flex, that renders most of the force to be put through the tibial tuberosity, causing a posterior translational force and rupture of the PCL. That being said, you can certainly get cutting or twisting injuries that involve the posterior cruciate as well. This is an x-ray where you can see some subtle changes, uh, clearly showing PCL insufficiency. This is a knee flex to 30 degrees, and you can see significant posterior translation of the tibia on the femur. You can also see a small flex sign just off the tibial tubercle, which is indicative of a distal patellar tendon rupture. In terms of the clinical examination, the posterior drawer sign is highly sensitive and specific. Posterior sag is also important to see as well. Uh, that's when you have the knees flexed to about 90 degrees and you can see a curvature or a concavity in one leg compared to the other leg. The quadriceps active test will show you uh, in a few seconds and followed by other tests as well. The dial test is important for posterior lateral or even posterior medial insufficiency and varus and valgus stress testing at 0 and 30 degrees. This is a posterior sag sign. You can see the image, uh, excuse me, the knee on the left shows posterior sag as compared to the one on the right. The left one has a grade two to three injury. And this is a quadriceps active test where the patient will fire their quadriceps with the knee flex to about okay. 60 okay. degrees to, to 70 degrees. And you can see that the tibia will essentially sit posterior and then auto reduce. Okay. Okay. In terms of grading of PCL injuries, when the tibia stays anterior to the condyles, essentially that's a grade one injury. When the tibia is flush with the condyles, that's a grade two injury. And when the tibia is posterior, that's a grade three, and that typically indicates both a PCL as well as a corner injury. In terms of the radiographic workup of PCL injuries, stress tests uh, and stressed x-rays are very important and very helpful. Uh, you can either use a telos device, gravity, or even these kneeling x-rays, which have shown uh, recent benefits and importance and are probably the most specific and sensitive uh, in terms of PCL injuries. And this has really been borne out by studies by Laprod. MRIs, obviously, are going to be necessary for your workup of PCL injuries. Here you can see... Um, this is from one of Dr. Bruce Levy's studies, uh, how to do a, knee, uh, a kneeling x-ray. You can see where the bump is located just off the tibial tubercles. Uh, and this is a, a, a picture showing excellent stability of the PCL after. In terms of associated posterior lateral corner injuries, perineal nerve injury rate is very high. It's anywhere up to about 25 to 30%. Patients with distal injuries uh, as we've shown in some of our studies here at NYU, uh, are going to have a higher rate of perineal palsy, anywhere from 40 to 60%. If the patient has a complete palsy of the perineal nerve, zero out of five strength, that means that only 50% of those patients are going to recover function. So it's very important to have a conversation with the patient and their family prior to any kind of reconstruction because they need to know that the outcomes are not particularly beautiful. Perineal nerve injuries can range anywhere from displacement of the nerve to complete disruption of the nerve. Sometimes we also see fibular head fractures, and these are arcuate fractures, where essentially the ligaments and, and capsule pull the, um, the fibula off, uh, excuse me, pull a fleck of bone off the fibular head. And it's really not to be confused with a Sagan fracture. You can see on, in this x-ray a very small horizontally oriented fracture uh, that's basically right off the fibular head and pulled up by about two centimeters. This is classic for a Sagand injury, excuse me, for an arcuate injury. As compared to a Sagand fracture, which we find are more vertically oriented and typically not resulting in significant displacement. And this is more pathognomonic of an ACL injury. In terms of PCL injuries, the question has always arisen as to whether or not to operate. If you look back at a Cochrane review from 2005, typically they say in grade two injuries you're going to treat it non-operatively, in grade three injuries you're going to treat it operatively. However, this really neglected to take into account the corners and really shows us that there was a lack of randomized controlled studies. But if we are going to treat it non-operatively, 
there are certain options. For grade one and grade two PCL injuries, we trial a brief extension splinting period with partial weight bearing followed by early range of motion and a quadriceps strengthening program and hopefully back to sports in about four to six weeks. For grade three injuries, which again are controversial because quote unquote, we really can't have an isolated grade three injury end quote without a, a corner injury. But if you're going to treat these non-operatively, you would mobilize for two to four weeks. Again, work on range of motion, quadriceps strengthening and progress weight bearing around one month and then return to sports at about three months. Current surgical indications for PCL reconstruction include posterior cruciate ligament bone avulsion fractures, which are displaced, which you can see in the top left picture, followed by fixation in the top right picture, excuse me, picture with a screw and washer construct. Combined ligamentous injuries involving the PCL are an operative indication, as well as grade three laxity. Chronic symptomatic PCL injury, regardless of grade, is an indication as well. And then I put this one at the bottom, refractory medial or patellofemoral pain or worsening chondral loss. And that might certainly be uh, a relative indication for PCL reconstruction because we know from t uh, studies by Tom Gill that PCL injured knees tend to have increased forces in both the patellofemoral compartment as well as the medial compartment. And this is very often. So remember this, medial and patellofemoral contact pressures increase when you have a posterior cruciate ligament injury. Something I want to highlight is the open posterior medial approach because these are important for fixing posterior cruciate ligament avulsion fractures. Typically we pace, uh, place the patient in the prone position and make a curvilinear uh, incision starting medially and then extending along the popliteal crease. You can certainly extend it laterally for a sort of like an S-type incision. And when we do this, we're developing the plane between the medial head of the gastrocnemius as well as the semimembranosus. That's a very safe plane. When you're elevating the medial gastrocnemius, you're actually protect, protecting the neurovascular bundle. You can even release the medial head of the gastrocnemius if necessary, but we find that that is often not necessary. And then we do our posterior capsulotomy. You can do it either vertically or horizontally, but we prefer to do it vertically. And we want to watch out for a recurrent branch of the, mid of the middle geniculate artery, which can sometimes be sitting right on the capsule. In terms of clinical outcomes after PCL reconstruction, they are generally favorable, but something often tested is tibial inlay versus tibial tunnel. And that's the mechanism of, uh, of which we drill the tunnel, uh, whether it's a complete tunnel through the tibia or just a small tunnel uh, which, with a blind ending tunnel in the tibia, and we find no differences. Single versus double bundle, biomechanical studies for the most part, systematic review and meta-analysis came out two or three years ago showing no differences. Clinically, we know that single versus double bundle, no difference. In terms of rehabilitation, everyone does something different, but the bottom line is you're going to protect the PCL. What I often use in my um, practice is a PCL uh, a brace to basically avoid hamstring, uh, excuse me, PCL brace to avoid tibial translation posteriorly in the early postoperative period. So these rebound PCL braces will basically keep the tibia sitting anterior, especially when the patient is lying supine, you want to avoid gravity pulling that tibia posteriorly. We avoid active hamstring firing for four to six weeks because again, that will pull the, the tibia posteriorly and put stress on the PCL and then return to sport anywhere between nine and 12 months. In terms of the posterior lateral corner, we know this is an intimate array of static and dynamic stabilizers and very frequently torn in multiligamentous knee injuries. Isolated posterior lateral corner injuries are obviously extremely rare. The components of the posterior lateral corner include the biceps femoris, the popliteus, the popliteofibular ligament, posterior lateral capsule, the arcuate ligament, as well as the lateral collateral ligament. These are broken into static and dynamic stabilizers. Your static stabilizers are going to be the lateral collateral ligament, which is most important for varus at 30 degrees, your posterior lateral capsule, as well as your popliteofibular ligament, which is sort of dynamic and static at the same time. Your dynamic stabilizers are going to include your popliteus, which is very important in preventing rotation at 30 degrees of flexion, 
your biceps tendon, as well as the iliotibial band, which is a little bit more anterior than the posterior lateral corner, but often injured in patients with multi-ligament knee injuries. We know again that there's really no such thing as a, as a grade three PCL injury because typically to have that much posterior translation, you have to have a corner involved as well. This has been demonstrated in studies by Schultz as well as Sakaya, showing that a combined injury to the PCL and the PCL results in more laxity than injuring either structure alone. So it's important that we know that the force in one or the other will increase when one of the two of them are disrupted. And the same goes for the posterior medial corner. These really act synergistically to prevent posterior translation of the tibia. In terms of contraindications for reconstruction uh, of the posterior lateral Come corner, back. lack of bone stock is obviously one. If the patient has significant varus deformity, that's also a contraindication. That's why we always get alignment views on chronic cases to pr make sure that they're not sitting in significant varus. If a patient has a varus thrust gait, that's also a sign that they might be better served by a high tibial osteotomy rather than a posterior lateral corner reconstruction, as well as patient factors, which might give you a worse outcome uh, when you look at the patient in more of a big picture. In terms of repairing versus reconstructing posterior lateral corners, we know from studies by Standard and Levy that repairs certainly are going to have a higher failure rate, anywhere from 35 to 40%, whereas reconstructions fail significantly much less, anywhere from 5 to 10%. Now we're going to move on to the MCL as well as the posterior medial corner. The MCL is the most commonly injured knee ligament, certainly more common than ACL, PCL, or LCL injuries. The injury pattern and mechanism is typically valgus and sometimes external rotation of the tibia. And when you look at the anatomy of the MCL, we know that it has superficial and deep components. The superficial MCL is extremely important. The femoral insertion is just proximal and posterior to the medial epicondyle. That's important to know both for testing purposes as well as reconstruction purposes. Distally, the superficial MCL actually has two insertions. One of them is proximally, about 1.2 centimeters distal to the joint line, and the distal insertion is just beneath the pes anserine, about six centimeters distal to the joint line. The deep MCL is basically made of a meniscofemoral and a meniscotibial component. The meniscotibial component inserts about three millimeters distal to the joint line. The posterior oblique ligament is a very important structure of the posterior medial corner, and it's very important with the knee in full extension. The origin of this is just distal and anterior to the gastrocnemius tubercle, and the insertion is just anterior to the semimembranosus. There are three arms of this, the most important being the central arm, and this is an important restraint to internal rotation as well as valgus at zero degrees. So if a patient opens up at val with valgus stress at zero degrees, you have to be concerned that the posterior medial corner and the posterior oblique ligament have been disrupted. There is a complementary relationship between the MCL and the posterior oblique ligament. And in terms of the MCL and posterior medial corner anatomy, Warren divided these into three layers. Layer one is the sartorius and the fascia associated with it. Layer two includes the superficial MCL, the posterior oblique ligament, the semimembranosus, and the MPFL, which is often tested. And layer three is the deep MCL and posterior medial capsule. I'm not going to go over this grading system in detail. You can certainly pause the PowerPoint presentation and go over how we grade MCL injuries from grade one to three. When we test these, we want to palpate the knee. Uh, you can easily tell an MCL injury where, where patients will have pain right over the medial epicondyle or distally where the uh, tear can certainly be. Often these patients will not have complete extension because uh, of either guarding or because of relative stiffness after the injury. Testing them at 30 degrees of flexion tests their MCL. However, testing at zero degrees of flexion tests the MCL as well as the posterior oblique ligaments as well as your cruciate ligaments.
it's important that uh, it's important to know that posterior oblique insufficiency can also increase external rotation at 30 and 90 degrees. So sometimes we want to be careful not to confuse this with the dial test. Excuse me. This is a video of a patient that has um, posterior medial uh, corner injury, as you can see. So this, so this with, is uh, zero degrees. Valgus stress at zero degrees and thirty She's degrees. There's opening, significant opening two plus both uh, in full extension as well as in flexion. Definitely. Two. When we look at posterior medial corner MRIs. It's important to find the superficial MCL, the posterior oblique ligament if you can find it, as well as the semimembranosus. The semimembranosus is noted by the red arrow in this axial cut. The blue arrow demonstrates the posterior oblique ligament, and the yellow arrow demonstrates the insertion of the MCL superficially. This is a patient with a disrupted MCL as well as posterior medial corner, but you can see the semimembranosus is intact. This is an MRI scan on the left showing us a grade one MCL sprain. Typically a patient will just present with pain medially, some potential range of motion loss and tenderness to palpation over the area of the injury. The picture on the right shows an almost complete femoral sided injury of the of the MCL which can often be treated non-operative. These pictures here demonstrate something that's a little bit more concerning. You can see the picture on the left uh, demonstrates a sort of a reverse Sagan fracture where the MCL is flipped underneath the fracture fragment and a different patient in the picture on the right actually shows the MCL torn distally and then flipped up underneath the meniscus. These are operative indications because you have to get the MCL out of the joint and restore its anatomy distally. This is a surgical video showing one of the patients from the previous slide. You can see that with valgus stress of the knee, the meniscus is going superior with the femoral condyle and the MCL is actually flipping into the joint. You can see the, the red tissue of the MCL demonstrating it's torn distally. It's impo also important to notice that the meniscus is going superior with the femur, which again confirms that the tear is distally. Yeah, must be. For treatment of MCL tears, the location is key. We know that proximal tears tend to heal very well with non-operative management. Distal avulsions, unfortunately, have a much lower healing rate because we because of this quote-unquote stenner type lesion. This is when the MCL flips anterior to the pes anserine, so the pes anserine becomes a mechanical obstruction to anatomic reduction of the distal MCL. They can also flip underneath the medial meniscus as we showed in some of the prior slides, and these in my opinion should certainly be re repaired acutely to get the, the best outcome. Operative indications would be your grade three tibial avulsions that we just mentioned, uh, as they can either flip into the joint or rest anterior to the pes anserine. These will not heal anatomically. Patients with acute multiligamentous knee instability, as well as chronic symptomatic isolated MCL insufficiency, which is certainly rare. These patients will often feel better with bracing because they can be a good judge of how they're going to do postoperatively. And again, we're going to make sure that these patients don't have underlying significant coronal malalignment, which might render a reconstruction to fail. In terms of reconstruction options, uh, you could either use one single graft, like an Achilles tendon, which has been described by Marx, or you can use a two-tailed reconstruction if you want to reconstruct the entire posterior medial corner. And these have been uh, really studied mostly by Laprade, uh, whose anatomic technique is described on the right, where you're using two separate grafts, one for the posterior oblique ligament and one for the superficial MCL. The superficial MCL, we're going to tension and fix it at 30 degrees, and the posterior oblique ligament, we're going to fix in full extension, as that is when the ligament is most taut. In terms of treatment and return to play for your collateral ligaments, for these um, minor in injuries and strains, uh, excuse me, sprains, it's usually one to four weeks for grades one and two. For a grade three isolated injury, typically it's five to eight weeks for return to play. Uh, 
And if we're going to manage these patients, it's usually about six to nine months for return to full sport. And we rehabilitate these patients in phases. Phase one, we obviously want to control the pain, swelling, and inflammation. The use of a brace can certainly be undertaken. Uh, we want to restore range of motion and good quadriceps activation and control. And then we go into phase two, which is more of the strengthening protocol, and we start straight line running. And in phase three, return to sport protocol. The return to play for all grades it's typically when we have pain-free range of motion, strength greater than 90% of the contralateral side, and no instability on clinical examination. This is a great slide from one of the papers by Dean Taylor. Uh, basically shows the criteria for advancement to each different phase in MCL rehabilitation, and you can certainly extrapolate this to LCL if you choose. If you want to pause the slide here and go over this, uh, you can certainly do so, but this is an excellent slide showing criteria for advancing to different phases uh, in MCL rehabilitation. So now we're going to go over a little bit about sports rehabilitation. This is sometimes tested on the in-service as well as the ABOS. And we're going to start with different muscle contractions and exercise types. So isotonic exercises basically are when the muscle contracts through the entire range of motion against a constant force. So the constant force is really the key here for an isotonic exercise. In terms of isometric strengthening, this is when the muscle contracts without any motion. So the myotendinous unit is actually not shortening in these patients, so it's sort of like when you're doing uh, a quadriceps set with a straight leg raise you're really contracting the muscle, but you're not moving the joint. In terms of isokinetics, this is when the speed of the contraction is fixed. The resistance can vary based on the force and your max loading through an entire range of motion. In terms of muscle contraction types, you have concentric versus eccentric contractions. Concentric muscle contractions imply that the muscle fibers are shortening. The origins and the insertions of the muscles are moving closer together. Eccentric contractions is when the muscle is lengthening despite contraction. Your quote-unquote negatives when you're working out in the gym. The muscle fibers develop significant tension during eccentric exercises, and they do produce a lot of strength. It's also important to know that eccentric contractions can certainly cause certain fracture types, uh, particularly the superior pole of the patella or the olecranon have certainly been shown to, to fracture based on an eccentric contraction. Then we can go into plyometrics. Plyometrics essentially mean that you're doing eccentric loading followed by immediate concentric contractions. So these are fast, forceful movements like box jumps. Uh, these are very important to train the muscles, the connective tissues, the nerves, and they're very important for ACL prevention and ACL rehabilitation as well. Open versus closed chain kinetic exercises. Open chain exercises basically mean that the end of the kinetic chain, for example, the hand or the foot, is not fixed. It's not planted on the ground or against a wall or against a machine. These are sort of like your quadriceps sets um, against resistance or bench press when you have shear forces on the shoulder. Closed chain exercises is when the end of the kinetic chain is fixed to the ground and, or to a wall or to a machine and it's not able to move freely. Uh, and this is really um, sort of like squats uh, and those kind of exercises. Those decrease shear forces and protect the ACL and increase compressile forces. Proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, not really often tested, uh, but it's any type of stretching which combines passive stretching and isometric stretching. Usually it needs a partner for this. It's a three-step process where you first uh, maximally stretch a muscle group, and then you do isometric contraction against that stretch. Then the arm is passively stretched again through relaxation. 
Modalities that are sometimes used in sports rehabilitation include ultrasound, um, phonophoresis, iontophoresis, as well as electric stimulation. Uh, you can certainly pause this slide to uh, read up on these, but these are all modalities that can be used in sports rehabilitation. ACL rehabilitation is often tested. After the acute injury, the key here is to reduce pain, inflammation, and regain muscle activation and full painless range of motion. What we're trying to do is endorse a biologically quiet knee that can be adequately trained and adequately prepared for reconstruction. Assistive devices are certainly not necessary unless quadriceps control is, is significantly poor. After patients have surgery, again, just like other um, uh, just like other algorithms, we divide these into three phases. The phase one would be to eliminate pain and effusion, restore quadriceps activation. We focus on regaining full extension immediately. It's extremely important in ACL rehabilitation, and then patients are often allowed to get onto an exercise bike, which endorses strengthening and motion. In terms of phase two, that's when we really focus on strengthening. We start with closed chain exercises where that foot is fixed against the structure like the floor. Uh, and we start jogging at about three months postoperatively. Phase three, we start sports-specific exercises and agility. And it's important that the leg strength is anywhere between 80 and 85% of the contralateral leg before we allow them to return to full sport and play. We want to minimize any residual atrophy and really focus on prevention. ACL prevention is key because we know not only can patients re-tear their operative side, but they also have a higher incidence of tearing their contralateral side than the native population as well. For ACL prevention, we focus on a few things, uh, the first of which is landing mechanics. When patients are coming down from a jump, we want to make sure that their knee is not dropping into valgus. We also want to make sure that their knees are not landing in full extension. So when they're landing, we typically want their knees to be slightly flexed, but pointing straight ahead. We do not want them going into valgus. Plyometrics are important, as well as neuromuscular control, which is often tested uh, and usually advocated more uh, for the female population than the male population, but all of these are certainly important. Plyometrics, as we know, can be very effective in ACL rehabilitation as well. Ankle sprain prevention is usually not tested very much, uh, but it's mostly proprioception and sensory motor training. And then I'll briefly touch base on blood flow restriction therapy because this is something that's gaining some steam and gaining some popularity in the sports rehabilitation world. Essentially what we're doing is endorsing an anaerobic environment when we're working out because when this happens, the body can recruit more low oxidative fast twitch muscle fibers, which are these type two muscle fibers. So what we do is we put the muscles in a, in a setting of low oxygen tension. And what that does is it endorses muscle protein synthesis, myogenic stem cells formation, uh, growth hormone production, as well as angiogenesis through VEGF. When you look at how BFR helps in terms of different operations, we know that it can help in ACL and sports rehabilitation. Cligus in their study in 2019 assessed a home-based BFR program uh, and found uh, significant increases in strength, muscle thickness, and symmetry compared to those treated without BFR. In a study by Lambert, we also found uh, similar findings. The, the lean muscle mass was decreased in the control group, but not the BFR group. And we also found that bone mineral density was actually better in those patients treated with blood flow restriction therapy. So in conclusion, BFR does seem to augment muscle recovery and protect bone density postoperatively. So this ends um, the talk on uh, other ligaments as well as sports rehabilitation. Uh, if there are any questions, you could always feel free to reach out. Um, if there are anything, anything that you're unfamiliar with or anything that you feel is uh, not ad adequately explained, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. And thank you for your attention.